camera trapping. Hello, my name is Danny. I am a wildlife photographer and today we're talking about camera trapping. It took me three months to work out my setup and it shouldn't be that complicated. There are loads of guides online and they say you need a camera, you need a sensor, you need a flash and you're good to go. But what camera, what flash, what sensor, what, how do you connect them, what cables, what transmitters? And today I'm going to talk about my setup. I'm gonna go through it as simply as I can. Hopefully it will make sense. I'm gonna talk about settings, the cost, and we're gonna set up in the field and hopefully it all makes sense. Let's begin. <laughs> Let's begin with discussing why you would even do this. Why would you invest all the money into creating a camera trap and it potentially breaking and all sorts? Why would you do it? So because you've got a sensor that triggers when the animal is in front of the camera, you don't physically need to be there, which means you can get really close to animals which might be quite difficult to photograph. The second thing is you can perfect the lighting conditions. You can have one flash, two flash, three flashes, you set it up like it's a studio, animal comes to the place you want it to be, and boom, you get your photo. Next, I'm gonna talk you through my setup. So I have a wired setup, which means it's wired. <laughs> when I was deciding what camera to buy and what sensor to buy, I was buying everything with the mindset that I was going to take it to the rainforest to photograph animals which are at low densities and have large home ranges, specifically cats like jaguars. I wanted a jaguar and so I wanted a setup that could last potentially months in the field without me having to touch batteries and having to change anything. And so that's why I've gone for a wired setup over a wireless setup. However, having a wired setup means you are limited with cables. Wireless allows you to position your flashes wherever you want and so you can try cool things such as backlighting and all sorts. You can't really do that without very long cables. Let's have a look at a basic wired setup. The setup should include a camera that is connected to the sensor two flashes either side of the camera. The first flash is connected to the camera with a TTL cable and the second flash is connected with a multi-flash cord and adapter into the first flash. This is where the magic happens. My camera trap setup consists of a Nikon D3300 cam traption sensor, two SB28 flashes, an SC28 TTL cable, the Nikon AS10 multi-flash adapter, the CSC26 multi-flash cord, and the Nikon DC2 cable. And that's the core kit, but then there's a whole load of other stuff. I have a Vanguard tripod, a gorilla pod with a broken leg, spring clamps with a ball head, a Pelicase 1200, plastic bags and elastic bands, a trail camera, and a whole ton of AA batteries. Let's go into the spec. This bad boy is my camera trap camera. It's a Nikon D3300, and I have an 18 to 55 millimeter lens. This shouldn't have even, right. Oh my goodness. This cost me, oh, it's on. This camera and lens cost me 200 pounds on eBay. You don't want to put a full frame fancy camera in the field and it might rain one night and everything gets ruined and I don't mind this getting wrecked. It would be a bit of a shame. Um, but I have bought this with the anticipation that it's not going to last long, especially if I took it to the rainforest. I bought this camera because it's 24 megapixels. <laughs> it has live view, so I can sort out my composition in the field very easily. It wakes up very quickly. It has a great battery life and it's cheap. Let's talk about this thing, the sensor. I wanted a wired setup, 
so I've got the, the Camtraptions PIR V2. V3, or version 3, is wireless. If you want, well, you do as you please, but I wanted a wired setup, so this was the good one. You can create, create, make sensor for relatively cheap, probably around £50, but this is, there's a lot of information about this online, a lot of photographers use this and it just seemed like a good choice to go for. Saying that, their manuals are pretty rubbish, so I'm going to explain that later. The next big thing is flashes. I have two SB28 and one SB28DX. I bought an SB28 and the DX at the same time, realised this was a DX, panicked and then bought an SB28. I don't need free flashes, maybe in the future I will, um, but I currently just use two in my setup. I alternate between which ones I use and I find there's no difference between the normal SB28 and the DX. Um, they're quite hard to come by on eBay, uh, so if you see one, grab it. You can get them pretty cheap, £50, but you're not buying an SB28 because it's cheap, you're buying it because it's the best for the job. They can last weeks, even months in the field on standby mode and they're just ready to fire and take a photo. This flash has an amazing button. I could do this all day. So satisfying. Right. The next bit is all the other stuff. Pelly case. I used a metal 80mm adapter on a screwdriver to cut this hole and my plan is to create a completely watertight uh, box with a UV filter so when I do eventually go to the rainforest my camera will be completely safe in a box and it will be watertight and I'll put rice socks inside and it should be okay. So for the moment I am happy to put my camera in the field with this and this will protect it against snow, yep, but against rain no chance. And then for my flashes I have plastic bags with what they're called elastic bands, there we go. The last thing you need is either little tripods or clamps clamps, and these go on trees for the flashes and you can have them upside down or whatever and these work great. Thanks for the tip Tom Mason. That's all the other stuff. Trail cameras are a great tool for monitoring the wildlife before you set up your camera trap. This is an all-in-one system that has a sensor, an infrared and camera and is super easy to use. They are less intrusive than a camera trap as there is no flash but animals often react to the red infrared light. I also often use it to monitor my camera trap and see how animals interact with the camera and the flashes. As you can see, the roe deer sees the camera, but she is too wary to walk in front of it. Now we're talking about settings. You know it's serious when you've got your notes out, right on your Camtraptions device. On the left side you have dials that can be either turned on or off and they determine the program mode. On the right side there are three dials that determine the sensitivity of the sensor. A high sensitivity will pick up small animals but may also be triggered by branches moving in the wind. 
The time dial is a time between shots. For example, you could have a program mode that takes two shots when triggered, but you can use this dial to increase the time between the camera taking the photos. This can be useful when you need flashes to wake up. The luminosity dial allows you to target nighttime species or daytime species. Okay, now I'm going to go through three programs on the sensor and the settings you need on your camera and your flashes. Yeah. Okay, program nine is a night mode. It is perfect for nocturnal species. For all modes, sensitivity will be dependent on what species you want to target. If you wanted to target large mammals, then you do not need it to be super sensitive. You want the time dial to be fully clockwise to allow the flashes to charge, and you want the luminosity anti-clockwise. Your camera shutter can be quite long, the flashes will freeze the animal, and a long shutter will expose some of the background. An aperture of around 10 allows a good chance that you will get the animal in focus. Since there is no ambient light, you want two flashes either side of the camera. The further and higher the flashes, the more natural it looks. I prefer to set one brighter than the other as it adds a little bit of shadow and I like how it looks. Program 11 is a day mode. You might only have one flash or no flashes at all, so you can increase the time between shots on the time dial. Luminosity should be fully clockwise as you only want the camera trap to work in daylight. Your camera shutter speed will be dependent on the target species and whether you have a flash connected. If you were to photograph birds in flight, you'd want a higher shutter speed to freeze the movement. Program 26 is a day-night mode that is difficult to get right. Your luminosity should be anti-clockwise to avoid ghosting, so the camera trap only works in darkness or low light. The camera shutter is set to bulb. This means that the sensor tells the camera what the shutter speed should be. In other words, in darkness, the shutter speed will be longer. In low daylight, it will be faster. Flashes should be set almost the exact same as in night mode. You can also be super clever and program the flashes to only operate at night. I have probably forgotten something and I might add it in a voiceover, but the only thing that's left to do is to set up in the field. Let's go! I have been setting up the camera for a few nights here now uh, and the deer know that Danny leaves potato and apple and carrots. What the? There's a bird, hang on. Two hours later. I don't know what that bird was, um, not something I'm familiar with. Anyway, so I am going to set up the camera and we're gonna have fun. Let's do it. So whilst you watch me set up, I will discuss some tips and tricks. Firstly, I place my camera bag where I want the animal. I use autofocus to focus on the bag and then I switch to manual. You do not want the camera working out the focus for you. I use live view to get my composition and framing right. Always test your settings in the lighting conditions you want to shoot to make sure the photo is correctly exposed and the sensor has the correct luminosity. So this is my setup. I very last minute decided to change everything but I've got the two flashes one is at 1 16th of a second the other one's at 1 4th of a second and I have set up the camera um, and I'm going to move some of the vegetables uh, so that the roe deer will definitely come at this spot well we hope <laughs>
Okay, so that's the camera, the sensor and the flashes all set up. I'm actually going to go back now and have some dinner and I'm going to return when it's dark to double check that all the settings are correct for night photography basically and because it's daylight right now so I can't really test um, the flashes so I'm going to go back and return in an hour or so when it's dark. So a lot of camera trapping videos that I have watched do not include something that I think is quite important which is the ethics behind camera trapping and I'm going to briefly discuss the ethics of using flashes and ways you can minimise any disturbance and generally just stuff you need to know about camera trapping wild animals. To begin with, I want to talk a little bit about animal eyes and vision. Mammal eyes consist of two types of photoreceptors, cone and rod. Rod photoreceptors are responsible for low light vision and cones are responsible for colour and daylight vision. Animals typically have higher concentrations of either rod or cone photoreceptors. Dogs are a good example. We often say that they are colour blind or that they have poor vision, but in reality they have more rod photoreceptors than us, and so they can see better in low light, but they have poor colour vision. Diurnal species such as squirrels have more cone photoreceptors. So that explains why the squirrels would sit on the log in front of the flash and be flashed about 400 times and they were completely unbothered by it and they didn't even move. On the other hand, the roe deer are crepuscular, so they have more rod photoreceptors and they are more sensitive to low light. And so when they were flashed from the camera trap, they typically did not return and so I was only getting one photo a night. The strobe light from a flash is not bright enough to damage animal eyes, especially if the animal is several meters from the flash. Once an animal has been exposed to a flash in complete darkness, it takes around five to 10 minutes for their eyes to return to the same low light functionality and there is no long-term damage. There are several things you can do to minimize the disturbance. The first thing is flashes have a diffuser. This softens the flash. Additionally, you can use an external flash diffuser. This one doesn't fit, but you can get them to fit your exact flash, or you can just use this and tape it around. Lastly, I always use plastic bags, mostly to protect against the weather, but a plastic bag will diffuse the flash even more. So if you use all these things, then you're diffusing and softening the flash. Additionally, the easy thing you can do is just reduce the intensity of the flash so it's not that bright. Especially when you have two, you can make them quite soft and so it's more of a fill flash to brighten up their face and then you can use a long exposure on the shutter to get the background exposed. So in regards to whether a flash will impact an animal's vision, it does not. However, if you're walking through a dark forest and you're suddenly exposed to two very bright flashes, it's probably quite scary. So although you're not going to physically damage the animal, you might startle them and they might not return. Lastly, let's talk a little bit about baiting. Um, baiting is fine as long as the animal is not becoming reliant on the food source and it is just supplementing their diet. It becomes dangerous when the animal needs that food to survive because it can't hunt or forage on its own, but if it's just a supplement then there's nothing wrong with that. If there's anything else you're confused with, just message me, we can work it out together. Um, but good luck and thank you for watching.